Sire, I am happy to report we have destroyed enemy strongholds on the Western Front and have made huge strides in our southern campaign with minimal losses. The new technology you have supplied us with have allowed our warlocks to shut down the enemy's best offensive weapons. Also, uh, the morale among the men has, uh, how shall I say this, been rather upbeat ever since you allowed gays to marry, sir. you decided to raise the wages of women to equal pay for both sexes. Though I have no idea why, perhaps the last cooties attack is still fresh on their minds. Nevertheless, as a result we have a 20% boost to army morale, but a negative 5 gold per turn for the next 6 turns. And sir, a personal thank you from me for making Gaba Juju leaves legal again. They're hallucinogenic properties are well known for medicinal purposes of course whoa 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 man far out I have like five fingers oh whoa damn it this is complete chaos what have I done? <laughs> hey, uh, hello, I, I didn't see you there. Uh, just making decisions for the angry army. Uh, don't worry about him, okay? He'll be fine. Now, there's no doubt that Dragon Commander is an ambitious project, unafraid to mix all these different elements together into a single game. You see, the game is a melting pot of some of my favorite parts of other games combined all into one. You take the interactive story cutscenes in between missions from StarCraft 2, add in turn-based combat with real-time battles on a campaign map from the Total War series, simplify a bit in the vein similar to Risk, then take Dragon Combat from Panzer Dragoon, Jetpacks, add elements of deck building from card games, throw in fantasy flavor, and bam! You've got Dragon Command. Now I know what you're thinking. Does this suicide mixture taste good? Oh, yes! I hate this! It is revolting! More? Please. I'd have to say, on the whole, yeah. Yeah, it does. And it's actually an enjoyable, yet cohesive gameplay experience. You really feel like you were running all the important aspects of an empire with the added bonus of interesting personalities that you interact with through the entire journey. By the seven, such heresy that Hellcat of a Catherine spouts. Championing the right of our women to vote is sacrilege, pure and simple. They'd beat her and put her behind bars where I come from. Now the story campaign is split up into three chapters, increasing in difficulty, length, and surprises. Essentially, you are an heir to the throne, and a dragon knight, a human with the ability to transform yourself into a dragon on the field of battle. And not any old dragon, mind you, but one that's been equipped with a friggin' jetpack! Aided by a powerful wizard who served with your father before his kingdom fell to your evil siblings, it's your task to put the pieces back together and unite the kingdom under your rule. The wizard brings with him the raven, 
your flying mobile command headquarters. Now, it's from rooms like these that you will plan your moves, assemble your armies, and attack the enemy using the campaign map on the bridge. Now, the campaign map gameplay, it's, it's relatively simplistic. You can only build one building per territory to create units, bolster gold income, uh, have action card generation, or generate more research points. You then move your armies around the board and play cards as you would in a good game of Risk. Now, it stays firmly in a capture and hold type of game rather than the depth that you might find in the Total War or Civilization series. But it also plays much quicker than those. Now, you won't be doing all this alone. In the game's biggest strength, its funnest aspect, you are joined by a team of generals, diplomats, and advisors who are to aid you in governing and waging your wars. Now, there's the standout hoity-toity General Edmund, who thinks he's above everyone else. Human ancestry taints your being, for humanity and weakness are two sides of the same tuppence I drop in beggar's hats. You son of a bitch! A bastard twice are you, my lord. Bastard born and bastard bred. Those are fighting words, sir! Put up your dukes. The aged veteran Henry... Let me tell your right of the bat, bastard, that I hold you in very little regard. The playful but deadly vixen Scarlet... How's it hanging, Commander? I'm Scarlet, and you're a dragon, they tell me. Always wanted to ride one of those, though... I bet you're a little harder to handle than a horse. All part of the fun, though, I reckon, so uh, give me a shout when I can take you for a spin. And the heavy-handed feminist former queen-turned-general Catherine. What's awesome? is that they each have a very unique and interesting personalities, all with their own story arcs that you can influence through dialogue sessions in between your battles. Catherine, for example, is extremely angry and resentful towards men who destroyed her own empire. You then shall either undo this gross travesty, this ignominious perversion, or by refusal, admit you two are nothing but a barren weed, afraid to be plucked, ridiculed, and cast aside by willful women, just like those skeletal cowards. <laughs> Wowie, okay. However, choices you make in the game can either lead to her becoming even more bitter towards men, especially if you ignore all of her requests, You'll set right this iniquity, Commander, and you'll do it now. That's not very nice to talk to me that way, but I have no problem with wage equality, so granted. Or you can earn her respect through progressive change, and she begins to treat you as an equal and as a champion of equality for women. My disposition may have sometimes betrayed my true appreciation. I know you will make for a great emperor, and it shall be my honor to fight by your side until the day comes victory shall finally be ours. It's all up to how you want to treat each of these characters and how you want to run your empire. I hope you'll like my jetpack. It is my gift to you. To keep without recompense for gladly shall I remain aboard this wondrous ship to tinker and toy, hammer and hew. Now, whenever you fight a battle on the campaign map in Dragon Commander, you're given a summary of what units are participating, what action cards you'd like to use from your Empire deck to assist, and who exactly will lead the battle. Your generals give you a large win ratio boost if you choose to auto-resolve by letting them take charge, but they cost their wage in gold. Otherwise, if you are confident enough with your combined arms and strength in numbers, you can just use the unlimited Imperial Army control to auto-resolve as normal. But the biggest game changer is being able to take direct control of the battle yourself. 
Now when you do so, you'll start with a single base and all the units that you brought into the battle. The game then plays out like a quick playing RTS. It's imperative, even more so in this game, to immediately branch out to other predetermined base locations to add to your limited manpower resource by capturing these new uh, recruitment centers and establishing your forward outposts. It's here that you also spawn yourself as the dragon high above the battlefield, transforming the game into this action shooter, just zipping around with your jetpack from engagement to engagement, supporting your armies and troops on the ground where necessary. <laughs> No, 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 don't, 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 don't kill them. Oh, they're gonna die. No, don't shoot that either. Damn it, you got me too. But I whooped your ass. You did, I know that you did. Necessarily appreciate Luckily, my ally was there. But be careful though, it's easy to push that too far and end up taking direct control of an unwinnable battle, which can lead some confuse players to complain about lack of balance or generally how unfair and frustrating the uh, RTS side of it was. And yes, exactly. Sometimes you can't win, you know, no matter what. It's just like in real war. If you go in with a 1% chance to win, you're gonna be like, this is fucking bullshit. This is not fun, I got my ass beat. Well, it's better for you to recognize when to retreat and skip the RTS phase altogether. Only engaging in close battles and keeping your technology up to date will improve your gameplay experience exponentially. Now, it's not all about war though, as you saw there at the beginning. You were declared emperor of the lands, so uh, of the ones you've already conquered. So four political advisors join you aboard the Raven in your throne room to help manage and debate their various faction positions on matters of the state. You have the undead, the elves, the dwarves, and the imps. They all have their own emissaries with their own biases, prejudices, and tendencies. No. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Right. Fucking thing sucks! Yeah. Now decisions you make in these governing sessions then affect, actually affect what you're doing. Their, their particular race's populist support of you. Uh, for major votes, each advisor will give their arguments on why you should or shouldn't enact a certain law. Commander, I intend to propose legislation later today that will make it possible for gay couples to be married. I know I'll get some pretty stiff opposition from Fullstaff and especially Yorick, so I'm hoping I can count on your support. Can't these queers be happy with what they have? Used to shoot them on sight barely a century ago. Damn, fool. You're one intolerant asshole. Now, after you make your decision as emperor, you will be shown how it affected your empire through a funny parody newspaper, uh, newly obtained action cards from your what you choose, and new conversation with the advisors post-vote. Hags, longing for anything but the male touch. Abhorrent is the hell you stage. So, you're backing the fairies, are you? Don't employ gays in military, education, health, or psychology. They'll be marrying goats next. They are the genociders, molesters, treasonous, deranged. He and his depraved ilk would allow men and women to fornicate with others of their own gender. P-E-N-I-S goes into the anus to rupture intestines. More a man does this, the more likely he'll be a fatality or a homicider. How base, how vile can one become? Don't allow hundreds of molestations a year with this equality ordinance. God save us from this debauchery. Now I won't spoil the majority of them, but it's just a fun mirror of current modern politics and the issues facing countries today. There are a ton of these throughout the game and everyone, including even some of your generals, have their own opinions and desires. 
Now, I know I'm a general and politics isn't my field of expertise, but I was hoping you'd support Oberon in his attempts to allow marriage for people of the same sex. It's a pet peeve of mine, you see. Live and let live, I say. Why do others get to decide who someone may or may not love? None of their bloody beeswax. Now, it's these branching paths in the game that allow you to make decisions that are different every playthrough. And while there is only one single ending to the main storyline, as I found out, there are a whole bunch of final results for each character aboard the ship. Here's one example. At the beginning of Chapter 2, you're given a choice to marry one of four princesses. Each princess has their own personality, storyline, and quests. Now sure, you can be obvious and choose the beautiful elf girl. No, you are not daydreaming, Commander. This is not a mirage that would trick your eyes. This unearthly beauty is real, and her name is Lohanna, princess of all. But well, what's the fun in that? I went with the undead princess. I, my lord and emperor, I stand here That settles it, does it not, Commander? <laughs> How can any man even contemplate the hand of another woman when he has met fair Ophelia? But appearances aren't always what they seem. Later on, uh, she will long to become alive again. Then through various quests and decisions that you make, she can end up becoming, uh, 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 be put into a gold robot by the imps or use questionable necromancy to have her inhabit the body of a beautiful young woman. How do I cherish these stolen moments when we are together? It seems silence finally holds sway upon this racket-ridden ship. And the only melody that dares intrude upon my soul is that of your heartbeat, constant as our love. And that's just two. There are two other creative results for her that I won't spoil. And, and that's just for the undead princess. I can't wait to see what's in store for the other three. Why, yes, my little dandelion. What woman in her right mind wouldn't want to marry an emperor? Tis a right treat that you're not so bad looking either. Now these bits are the best part of the game that invest you in the world, running around the ship, hearing what everybody has to say about your governing style and your major decisions as emperor. It keeps you driving forward between battles to see what happens next. But unfortunately, it is sometimes those battles that the game falters a little bit. It, it, its RTS elements just aren't up to par with its competition. Um, a combination of dragon balancing issues, rewarding Zerg rush mentality, and the extreme amount of micromanagement needed for specialized and upgraded units such as uh, warlocks and shamans make it a daunting and frustrating affair for beginners. Add into that these new dragon mechanics and skills that you have to manage and most will be put off by its extremely fast pace and high learning curve. Now sure the game has a few short tutorial sections but that doesn't touch on many of the finer points of gameplay unfortunately like the card system, the various unexplained icons on the campaign map and a bunch of other stuff. The tutorial sucks. Now, controls in the RTS section are also a bit of an issue. The camera control could use some tweaking, and when you're in dragon form, it's a bit awkward to attempt to select and direct your units until you get the hang of it. Now, also, while you're in that dragon mode, you are unable to select buildings to continue to spawn new units, which is ever so important to flood the enemy's rigid Zerg-like AI. It's, it's a tough balancing act to do for new strategy players. Do you want to be the dragon for a little bit, or do you want to continue flooding your enemy? I just wish there was better balance between the two. I don't recall the AI ever attacking me with a dragon on their own. Only in multiplayer. Also, I gotta do this. It's my personal preference. I think the rather ho-hum unit designs in the game, they're, they're exactly the same looking for everyone, regardless of faction. That's disappointing. I can see that they wanted to 
to go and, and do these creative large war machines, but ultimately they just have a static and unrelatable feeling and that at times they just look unfinished to me even though they are. Uh, they just seem out of place next to the dragons and the more traditional fantasy troops which I would have enjoyed quite a bit more to see. Um, another issue with the real-time battles is how often the actual battle maps you will fight on will repeat. It pulls you out of the sense that you're in this massive world when you keep seeing the same fucking terrain features over and over regardless of where you're fighting on the damn campaign map. It's a shame since everything else in this game builds up that grand sense of scale and control. Picking up their scent. Dead set to it. I've heard reports about the imminent arrival of enemy warlocks. I should also mention that on the campaign side of things, in my playthrough it seemed far too easy to max out on gold and all the technologies by chapter 3, especially if you get into a bit of a stalemate in chapter 2, and it takes away all of the challenge uh, for the finale. And I was disappointed that you don't fight this evil that you meet in chapter 2 in a more di direct and climactic way, no spoilers. Finally. There is no diplomacy as you're ultimately at war with everyone, your brothers, your siblings. So there's no negotiations in the single player campaign. Now, that's left to the multiplayer side of things. Now, multiplayer is a ton of fun, but unless you're extremely good at microing, it can be a bit tough uh, without lowering the game speed with all the options out in front of you. Now, I do worry a little bit about balancing too, but everything does seem to have a counter, at least in my playthrough. Um, it's just how fast you are at reacting to that. Um, one of the easiest areas of the game to neglect is dragon upgrades. This is extremely important, especially in multiplayer, as certain dragon types, there are three, have strengths and weaknesses that need to be bolstered by higher level dragon abilities, especially if you get into dog fights. Where are oh, <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> nice. So if you find that your normal fireballs aren't effective any longer against the enemy, it's time to upgrade your dragon with immensely powerful expert abilities like a Pillar of Fire that does a ton of damage to units in an area of effect. Enemy dragon incoming. So that all brings me to my final verdict. It's been a bit of a while since we've seen anything or anybody bring something new to the table uh, in, in strategy. And while none of these ideas are particularly new, the way they are all combined and mixed together here into one overall enjoyable game makes it worth the effort. The final verdict for Dragon Commander is a very solid 7 out of 10. But it gets a badass seal of approval for having the balls to do it and execute it well enough. Now, if you're a fan of strategy, buy it and try it. You won't regret it. And if you can't get the hang of the RTS battles, you can always then leave that up to your generals and auto-resolve through those. It's still an enjoyable game with its RPG elements and its campaign map play. Now, filled to the brim with unique characters, a good sense of humor, uh, an interesting and unique narrative, uh, excellent voice acting, and a cool premise, Dragon Commander is a surprising treat, especially for fans of strategy. It's only priced at $40 for like endless hours of empire running and war raging goodness. Now, if only it had more polish and time on its RTS elements, this would be an instant classic. But there's really good ideas here, 
and I hope that we see some of them reworked or refined in the future. Until then, I'll see you guys on the next Angry Joe Show.